Hi guys, in this video we're going to take a look at opposite statements, structure of a proof by contradiction, proving root 2 is irrational by contradiction, examples, and then we'll finish with a summary. So what exactly are opposite statements? We've seen examples of proof by deduction. We've been able to prove by deduction that the sum of two odd numbers is odd. We're going to use a new method of proof, which involves deducing a logical inconsistency. We're going to be disproving certain results with inconsistencies. Given a conjecture, we start by considering the opposite statement. Consider the following conjecture. There are infinitely many primes. This is a statement that we'd like to prove. Then the opposite statement in this case is going to be that there are finitely many primes, as opposed to infinitely many. If we can deduce that this statement is false, we will have proven our original conjecture. So we wish to show that having finitely many primes is inconsistent. We would like to use this method to prove results that we are not able to do directly. In particular, we'd like to start by asking the question, are there finitely or infinitely many primes? So what is the structure of a proof by contradiction? The process of taking the opposite of a conjecture and showing that it is not possible is called proof by contradiction. We take our conjecture, we form the opposite statement, we show that this opposite statement is inconsistent, and then we have proved our original conjecture into a theorem. This is the structure of a proof by contradiction. We are looking to deduce a logical inconsistency with the opposite statement. So in our case, we have the opposite statement as being there are finitely many primes. We will then have proven our original conjecture. If we can show that our opposite statement is in fact false, then this means that our original conjecture must be true, and hence we will have proven our result. In this case, we write down our finite list of primes and form a special number from them. We are considering our opposite statement, i.e. that there are finitely many primes. So we have our list of primes we can write down. P1 is our first prime, P2 is our second prime, all the way up to our last prime, the kth prime. And this is our finite list of primes. No matter how large it is, it's certainly finite, by assumption. And then we're going to let capital N be a number formed by multiplying all the primes together, i.e. P1, P2, all multiplied together with PK at the end, and then we plus 1. This special number must be divisible by a prime number. This is because it's bigger than any of the numbers on our list, so itself cannot be prime. If it were prime, then we'd be done, because we have a contradiction already. We found a new prime given our list of finite primes. So we assume in the worst case, it's not a prime number, and hence it's a composite number formed by having factors that are prime. So we can consider a general prime number dividing it. What we do is we let P be some prime number dividing the number N. We can check if this prime number is any of the primes on our original finite list. If we examine P1, we can see that P1 cannot divide the number capital N. This is because the number capital N is such that it's equal to P1, P2, all the way up to PK, plus 1. And so if this number P1 were to divide N, then since P1 also divides P1, P2 up to PK, trivially, because P1 is a factor right here, then it must be the case that N minus this whole quantity is divided by P1 as well, because P1 is a factor of both of these numbers. But N minus this quantity is just 1, and P1 cannot divide 1 unless P1 was equal to 1, but we assume as our axiom that 1 is not a prime number. And so we deduce that P1 cannot divide N, and for the exact same reason, P2 can neither divide N as well. And this is the same for all the numbers on our list all the way up to pk cannot divide n. And therefore our number p 
cannot be equal to any of these primes, P1, nor P2, nor any of them all the way up to PK. Because P has a property which none of these numbers have, it itself divides capital N. But none of these numbers themselves divide N. And therefore, we cannot have that P is any of these primes. And hence, we have found a prime not on our original list, giving us a contradiction. P is a prime, but not on our finite list of all primes. This is our logical inconsistency that we discussed earlier. We call this a contradiction. This means that our original conjecture must be true, and so we have proven it. We have proven that there are infinitely many primes. Similarly, how can we prove that root 2 is irrational by the process of contradiction? There is another famous proof by contradiction, namely the proof that root 2 is irrational. We actually require a lemma for this proof, one which itself needs a short proof by contradiction. We need the result that if a squared is even, this means automatically that a must be even, where a is an integer. In order to prove the lemma, we consider the opposite statement. The opposite statement to the above is the statement that a squared is even, but a is odd. This is the opposite to our above implication statement. We can write the odd condition for a algebraically. We have that we can write a as two lots of some number k plus 1. This is what it means to be odd. And k has to be an integer. We can then square this expression to consider a squared. And we get that a squared is going to be equal to 2k plus 1 all squared. And this is equal to 4 lots of k squared plus 4k plus 1 by expanding out. And we can factorise this as 2 lots of 2k squared plus 2k plus 1, where the plus 1 is strictly outside. And this tells us that a squared is in fact odd, and this gives us our contradiction. We've been told as part of our assumption that a squared is even, but a is odd. But a being odd has shown us that in fact a squared is also odd. Therefore we have by assumption that a squared is even, and we've shown that a squared is odd. A number cannot be both even and odd, and this is our logical inconsistency, i.e. our contradiction. So the original conjecture must be true, i.e. that a squared is even implies that a is even. We can now begin the main proof by assuming the opposite statement is true. We have our conjecture, which is that root 2 is irrational. We can consider our opposite statement, which is that root 2 is in fact rational. And we hope to show that there is a logical inconsistency or contradiction with this opposite statement. We can write this opposite statement algebraically. If root 2 is rational, we can write root 2 as the ratio a over b. But we can impose particular conditions on the values of a and b. Namely, firstly, that a and b must be integers and similarly, that a and b share no common factors. This is an assumption that we can make to ensure that a over b is in its simplest form. We wouldn't want to write our root 2, for example, as 6 over 4, when we could write it as 3 over 2. So we're just going to assume that a and b share no common factors, so that we get our root 2 in our simplest form of its fraction. But this statement would in fact give us our logical inconsistency. All we have to do now is to show that they do indeed share a common factor. Performing the square of both sides removes the root. We have our root 2 is equal to a over b, and we can get that a squared divided by b squared is equal to 2 by squaring both sides. Removing fractions is useful since it's easier to work with integers than fractions. We get that a squared is equal to 2 multiplied by b squared. We can then deduce a result about a. Since a squared is equal to 2b squared and b is an integer, so b squared is an integer, we have that a squared must be even, since by definition it is twice an integer. 
This is where our earlier lemma can now be applied. We have that a squared is even gives us that a is even. Then we can also write this condition algebraically. If a is itself even, we can write a as two lots of some number c. We can then expand the square, cancel the factors, and deduce a similar result with b, and apply our earlier lemma again. So we showed that a squared was equal to 2b squared. Then we can substitute in our 2c for a. So we have 2c and then all squared. That's our a squared. And this is equal to 2b squared. By expanding the square, we're going to get a 2 squared, which is 4, and then a c squared. And this is equal to 2b squared. Then we can cancel the factor, and this gives us b squared is equal to 2 lots of c squared. But again, c is an integer by our above condition for a. And this gives us that b squared is even, since it is twice an integer. But recall that since b squared is even, our earlier lemma tells us also that b is even. And this gives us our contradiction. We have that a is even, and also that b is even. By definition, this means that a and b share a common factor of 2, since they are both even. And this gives us our contradiction, since above we have that they share no common factors, but here we have that they share a common factor of 2. And this is a logical inconsistency. And hence, we can finally deduce that our initial conjecture was correct. Our initial conjecture is now true, because our opposite statement was false. And therefore, we've proven that root 2 is irrational. And we can put down our nice square box to finish our proof. Let's take a look at some examples. Our first example asks us to prove by contradiction that if n squared is multiple of 3, then so is n, where n is a natural number. Our first step is to write out the opposite statement. This is how we do proof by contradiction. The opposite statement is that n squared is a multiple of 3, but n is not. This is the opposite statement of n squared is multiple of 3, and then so is n. Our second step is to split up into cases. We have that n is not a multiple of 3. This gives us two different cases, namely n is 1 more than a multiple of 3, and n is 2 more than a multiple of 3. Our third step is to consider the first case, namely that n is 1 more than a multiple of 3. Therefore, we can write n as 3k plus 1, where k is an integer. Then we can consider n squared, and we're looking to induce a logical inconsistency. Because we have that n squared is a multiple of 3, we like to show that n squared is not a multiple of 3 simultaneously. And so n squared is equal to, by the above, in this case, 3k plus 1 all squared. By expanding, we are going to get 9k squared plus 6k plus 1. And we can factor out a 3 where appropriate to get a 3 lots of 3k squared plus 2k. And then we have a plus 1 right on the end, i.e. n squared is not a multiple of 3 in this case. Our fourth step is to consider the second case. This is the case we can write n as 3k plus 2, i.e. n is 2 more than a multiple of 3. Then we find n squared by squaring our expression, so we have 3 lots of k plus 2, and then we have this all squared. And we can expand this out as 9k squared plus 12k, plus 4. Then we can factor out our 3, and we're going to get 3 lots of 3k squared plus 4k, and then we can write a plus 1 inside the bracket, and a plus 1 outside the bracket. And so again, we have the n squared in this case is not a multiple of 3 either. And so our fifth step is to write out the contradiction. We have that in either case that we've examined, n squared is a multiple of 3 by assumption, but we've shown that n squared is not a multiple of 3. And this gives us our contradiction. Our last step is to state the conclusion. We have proven that if n squared is a multiple of 3, then indeed n is also a multiple of 3. This is our original conjecture, which we've now proven, 
into a theorem. Our second example asks us to assume without proof that if n squared is multiple of 3, then so is n. This is our previous result. And using the above result, we're asked to prove by contradiction that root 3 is irrational. Our first step is to write out the opposite statement, namely that root 3 is rational. We're going to be following the same procedure as we did for root 2. Our second step is to write this condition algebraically, with conditions. Namely, we can write root 3 as some number a divided by some number b. But these numbers have conditions, namely a and b are integers, and we can assume that a and b share no common factors to ensure that a over b is in its simplest form. Our third step is to determine a condition on a. We can square our expression and get a squared over b squared is equal to 3. Then we can multiply up and we'll get that a squared is equal to 3 lots of b squared. So we can deduce that a squared is a multiple of 3, because b is an integer, and this is the definition of being a multiple of 3. Our fourth step is to use the lemma from our previous example, namely that a squared being a multiple of 3 means automatically that a is a multiple of 3, because a is assumed to be an integer. Our fifth step is to write the result algebraically. We can write a as being equal to 3 lots of some number c, because a is a multiple of 3, and c has to be an integer. Our sixth step is to substitute the result and obtain a new result for b. We have our equation a squared is equal to 3 lots of b squared, and we can substitute in our a to have 3 lots of c, and then all squared is equal to 3 lots of b squared. We can then expand out and we get 9c squared is equal to 3 lots of b squared. Then we can divide to get that b squared is equal to 3 lots of c squared. And this gives us, by definition, that b squared is also a multiple of 3. Our seventh step is to use the lemma again. Namely, that b squared is a multiple of 3 tells us by our earlier lemma that b is also a multiple of 3. Our eighth step is to determine the contradiction. Namely, we have that a is a multiple of 3, and we also have that b is a multiple of 3. And therefore, a and b share a common factor of 3. But we assumed above, rightly so, that a and b do not share any common factors, and this gives us our contradiction. Our last step is to state the conclusion. Our opposite statement is a contradiction, and so our original conjecture is true. Root 3 is irrational. Our last example asks us to prove by contradiction that the curves y equals x to the power of 4 plus 7x squared plus 5 and y equals x squared do not intersect. Our first step is to write down the opposite statement. The opposite statement is that the curves y equals x to the power of 4 plus 7x squared plus 5 and y equals x squared do indeed intersect. This is the opposite of them not intersecting. Our second step is to form an equation from the opposite statement. If they intersect, we can set them equal and solve for their x coordinates. And so we get x to the power of 4 plus 7x squared plus 5 is equal to x squared at the points of intersection for their x coordinates. Our third step is to attempt to solve this equation. We can rearrange and we'll have that x to the power of 4 plus 6x squared plus 5 is equal to 0. We can then factorise for x squared in both brackets, and we get an x squared plus 1 and an x squared plus 5, and this product has to be equal to 0. And this gives us two equations, namely x squared is equal to minus 1, or x squared is equal to minus 5. Our fourth step is to write down the contradiction. Our two equations for the x coordinates do not have any solutions. But our opposite statement tells us that they do intersect. Therefore, the x coordinates should exist, and this gives us our contradiction. Our fifth step is to state the conclusion, namely that the curves y equals x to the power of 4 plus 7x squared plus 5 and y equals x squared do not intersect. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level math resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. 
Just click the Snap and Smiley face, and together, let's make A-Level Maths a walk in the park.